Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here, and thank you for the invitation to the panel. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I and we are on unceded Coast Salish territories, lands of the Musqueam, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Squamish people, um, and recognizing that the context of struggle in the city is completely located in the fact that these are unceded territories and that the city is constructed on, on lands that uh, Indigenous peoples continue to hold jurisdiction and title to. Um, actually, listening to the, the struggles at Vive ER, um, and also congratulations to Local 40 for Zayelda, Compañera Zayelda's election, but um, I was also thinking about the YVR as a site of a detention center, right? So uh, immigrant holding cells are in the YVR. And for me, the city is mapped by so many locations that underneath which there's such intense violence. And of course, again, overwritten by ongoing colonial violence. But the YVR for us three or four years ago uh, was a massive campaign to shut down the cells at the YVR, the immigration detention center there, particularly after the death of Lucia Vega Jimenez, who was a Mexican migrant woman uh, who committed suicide at VIVR upon facing deportation by CBSA and Canadian Border Services Agency. And, you know, the YVR is just one of many sites where CBSA operates uh, detention centers. The other is the public library a block from here. So whenever you're at the public library, just under there is a detention center uh, at, the, at the VPL. And so um, for me, when I'm thinking about the context of struggle, um, and as someone for whom my organizing is located in a couple of different spaces and communities, a lot of it is this idea of, you know, how do we even make visible these sites of violence that are taking place every single day? Um, and also how to do it in a way in which we can hold the fact that these violences are systemic ongoing and try to win something within that, right? How do you win something in the context of ongoing violence? Um, and actually recently, uh, one of the things that we won out of our campaign, uh, which was to shut down the holding center at YVR, was something that we won. So now the YVR uh, holding center is going to be closed, uh, be and not because of anything that's particular to the campaign, but especially because it focused on the issue of legal rights, because it's one of the only holding centers where lawyers are not able to go in and access uh, detainees, and detainees can't access legal counsel. But, you know, as often happens with things that seem like victories, what's happening now is all of those detainees are being transferred to Fraser Correctional, which means they're actually farther away from any kind of access to their families and communities. And so it's you know also a reminder of thinking about the ways in which sometimes, not always, sometimes, uh, often perhaps, uh, some of our, our, um, our, our kind of reform aims and incremental gains can work against the interests of freedom, right? Um, and so it just made me think of that in the context of, of the YVR and hearing you speak um, about the YVR as this great airport and all the different forms of exploitations that are taking place. Um, uh, the, the things that, the first question in terms of what would need to be gained uh, in your areas of struggle, um, one of them I kind of again touched on, which is really just making visible the kinds of violences that are invisible and or normalized. Uh, you know, not far from this neighborhood is the downtown east side. Um, some of the work that I've been doing most intimately for the past 15 years is particularly working with indigenous women who've been raising the issue of ongoing colonial gendered violence in not limited to the downtown east side, but for which the downtown east side is an epicenter. Um, and really, you know, when, uh, when Picton was was charged and convicted, a lot of the ways in which people were understanding that violence was framed around a serial killer, right? And it's literally taken 30 years for there to even be a conversation about how this is systemic and ongoing. It's not just about one person. It's in the child apprehension system. It's in housing. It's in the, in the fact that there's no housing on reserve, right? So the fact that we also have to talk about what's going on on reserve, that 70% of indigenous women in BC no longer live in their home communities, cannot live in their home communities for different reasons, um, either because of the Indian Act that's forced so many women to lose status, or because of course ongoing land devastation, and the fact that there's been patriarchal um, imposition of, of land codes and housing codes in a lot of different communities. Um, so for me, that's one, uh, area of, of organizing and work and the other around migrant justice. And today, you know, most of my day today was spent, uh, as for many of us, in dealing with awful, awful crises and the realities that people face every single day. 
Um, so the past few months I've been working with uh, a man who's currently hospitalized at, in a hospital, I won't say where, in a, in a hospital in Surrey, um, and he's actually unconscious. And he became unconscious upon crossing the border from the United States on foot, crossing at Zero Avenue down by Delta, down by Delta and the Peace Arch. And he crossed irregularly because we have the Safe Third Country Agreement in place, which was actually brought into place by the liberals. It's not a conservative era um, legislation. It's also not a Trump era legislation. It is a liberal era legislation from 2004. Uh, that basically says that if you are claiming asylum in Canada, if you come at a regular port of entry, you will be, with some minor exceptions, turned back. But if you cross irregularly, quote unquote illegally, then you can cross, right? So basically it's incentivizing people to force, to, to cross irregularly, and then they get criminalized as illegal, right? As crossing illegally. But so this man um, crossed, he's, he's from Afghanistan, he crossed irregularly at Zero Avenue. He collapsed shortly after, as many people have been, making this dangerous journey up north. And he collapsed shortly after he crossed the border. And he's actually been at the Surrey Hospital for the past three months. He's been unconscious, in and out, for most of his time there. For a brief period, CBSA actually tried to detain him and then realized they didn't actually want the medical liability and released him. Um, and now, one of the things that's happening is that the hospital is trying to medevac him back, even though they're actually not really sure where they're going to medevac him to, because he has false documentation, as many people do, because they don't want to pay his hospital bill. And he's unconscious, right? And so, um, for me, this is just one small part of when we're thinking through migrant justice, and also thinking about the ways it operates in terms of the ways in which we defend our public services, is realizing that our public, our public services are, you know, are also need to be greatly expanded, and there's many fights there. But we also have to think about the ways in which how we think of the public often gets weaponized against people who are not Canadian. Because so much of the idea of public services, whether it's housing, whether it's childcare, whether it's schools, whether it's healthcare, has actually not worked for people who don't have full legal status because people are actually not entitled to access services. And then often, <laughs> the fact that they're not with full status is actually used against them, and the Canadian taxpayer is used as the kind of weapon, right? That you are a drain on the Canadian public, that you are not a deserving Canadian public person. Um, so for me, the, the idea of the right to the city is also deeply connected to the idea of, well, who has the right to access the city? Who has the right to access all of these services? Um, and of course, knowing that you know, that right, even though it may exist on paper for Canadian citizens, is stratified across so much exclusion, of course. Um, and also understanding that for some people, the very fact that you can't get in the door without ID, right? You can't actually get um, access uh, to many of these kinds of services. Um, the other situation today was accompanying uh, a mother who's uh, an indigenous mother. And she's actually leading an unprecedented case against MCFD. As we know, of course, MCFD, there are more kids currently in Ministry and Child and Family Development care, which is really not care, it's apprehension and kidnapping, than ever were in residential school. And she's leading an unprecedented case at the BC Human Rights Tribunal to get her kids back. Um, and, you know, she's one of literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mothers for whom just being able to live as a family is your daily struggle. The things that many of us, including me, are able to take for granted, that we're gonna have our kids, we're gonna be able to see our children, we're gonna be able to be with our children, we're gonna be able to grow our kids, is something that thousands and thousands of single moms, especially indigenous single mothers in this province, do not have the basic right to. They don't have the right to their families, and by extension that means the entire loss of language and culture and nationhood. And this is, of course, deliberate. Um, and so it's for me, and often in these kinds of seemingly individual scenarios, but are deeply intimate when we think about the psychological wear down of what it means to claim a right to the city, right? It means that there are so many people who are, as we know, just surviving to, to make it through in their day to day um, in so many different ways. And so um, what needs to be one, there's a range of different things. So you know, at the city level, for example, um, when it comes to immigration, there's the right to access to services um, at a bare minimum. I think a much more substantial one is making sure that people aren't actually deported. Um, and a lot of that has to do with law enforcement, like VPD. Uh, we had a campaign with TransLink police 
And so making sure that people that are most likely, the arms of the state, law enforcement, that are most likely to turn people over to CBSA are actually not able to do that, right? That's the most robust kind of um, sanctuary city, if you will. Those are the kinds of sanctuary cities in the U.S. that aren't simply about access to services, but they're also making sure people can remain, right? People aren't turned over to CBSA. Um, the other kind of uh, piece around the city, uh, and again, access to services, is making sure that people have a right to services regardless of access to ID. Um, and also it's largely conceptual too, right? So going back to this idea of uh, the ways in which violence is embodied so much, especially in the context of austerity, is the ways in which migrants and especially immigrant workers are scapegoated. And we've seen this across many movements for a long period of time, and to some degree still ongoing. Uh, much of the labor movement its response to migrant workers was to abolish the temporary foreign worker program. Not simply because of the abuses of the TFW, which are of course we know, right, the fact that migrant workers are exploited and that's the exploitation of migrant workers is inherent to the fact that they don't have full legal status, but also partly it was accompanied by the call of Canadian jobs for Canadians, right? So it wasn't simply around a response to exploitation, but it was the idea that somehow the wage floor was being uh, the wage floor was being dropped because of the presence of migrant workers, to which I would argue, and many others would argue, is the response is actually, to, in order to uh, lift up the wage floor, we need to make sure that all workers around the world, whether migrant workers or not, are able to have a right to a dignified life and a living wage, right? Because migrant workers are simply the flip side of outsourcing. It's insourcing labor that is a cheap labor pool in the global market. And nationalism and protectionism is not only a xenophobic and racist response, it actually does nothing. It further stratifies the labor market, right? It further creates a segmentation across labor, um, across people who are working and laborers. And so um, those kinds of, that's just one of many responses that, is, that are common in the context of austerity. We see it right now with a very false narrative that Justin Trudeau and also the city uh, are giving more to refugees than they are to homeless people and working people, which are A, not true. You know, in Ottawa, for example, last year, every single sponsored refugee, um, which again is like less than 0.01% of the world's refugee community and population, it's, you know, all PR, but every single one of them last year was using the food bank in Ottawa. Every single one of the 257 sponsored refugees that were in Ottawa, right? And that's very, that's very similar to especially other large major urban areas. And so um, a big part of what needs to be won is I would argue in some ways ideological, right? It's actually building understanding and support for what it means to be in alliance with people who are displaced and also understanding that these struggles, coming to how these struggles can be connected, that you know, when, we're th when we're thinking through climate justice, as some folks have talked about, you know, one, of the, one of the single largest importers of tar sands is US Department of Defense. The US Department of Defense is one of the single largest importers of tar sands. So we can't have a climate justice movement that doesn't understand the connections to the military industrial complex and understanding that the military industrial complex, both Canadian and American, the entire imperialist agenda, is completely connected to how and why people are displaced. We live in a city where 70% of the world's mining headquarters are operating, right? So migrant justice movements also mean shutting down these mining companies that are in our city that are displacing people, that are forcing people to lose their lands both within Canada and globally. And so for me, these are all the ways in which we can see these connections, right? The ways in which these systems are intertwined, that displacement is really um, a vastly global phenomenon. Um, and the last, and you know what, what I think it does is it forces us to pivot our framework so that it's not just about how do we amalgamate a bunch of different issues and stick them together. Um, for me, the kind of most disheartening coalition politics have either been ones that force us to move to the center in order to accommodate everybody. Um, and you know, as if though there's this kind of mythical middle person, <laughs> right, who does that even represent? Um, and also the kind of failures of thinking that coalition politics is just uh, the, the sum of all of its parts, right? That if we just add up all the issues, we're gonna end up with a coalition. And that can be true, right? We can have a laundry list of things. 
um, and sometimes that happens. But you know, for me, it's it's been much more fruitful in thinking about ways to work together when we see the ways in which power operates, which isn't just like, here's your issue, here's my issue, let's tack them together, you show up for me, I'll show up for you, but to understand deeply how these are connected, right? How displacement really is operating in so many ways, uh, whether people are being displaced from their home, from their land, from their communities, glo locally, globally, um, displaced on the street. And so for me, in thinking about the ways we can work together, I'm interested in not the idea of bringing single issues together, but looking deeply at the ways in which power works together. Um, and I, you know, I'll, I'll end with a, a quote for, by Eduardo Galeano, because for me, it kind of brings it home, uh, not in an abstract theoretical way, but in a, in a grounded way. Eduardo Galeano, one of the things that he's, he's said, of the many that he has said, is that the world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. The world was born yearning to be a home for everyone. And I think the politics of home, both the intimate politics of home and what it means, um, and also the broader conceptual ideas of home um, are really ways in which we can think of how to, how to be in, in solidarity and in practice together. Thank you.